This is The Interested Interview. I'm your host, JJ Clark. And today we are talking about sex, dating apps, technology and relationships. And to help me with that task is sex researcher, therapist, educator and professor at the University of Wisconsin Stout, Dr. Marky Twist. As a ways of beginning, can you tell us just uh, about where dating apps came from and just even a wee history of them? Yeah, absolutely. So if you've ever heard that song by its skate, Do You Like Pina Coladas? I think that's a good uh, homage Mm -hmm. to where dating applications really came from. So they were personals in newspapers, and it might shock people uh, like your listeners and maybe yourself to learn that the first personal ad actually appeared in 1685 in a British agricultural journal. Um, And it it was really well received. And since then, people started publishing more and more, uh, you know, personals in newspapers. Uh, And that was the origins. And then the first computer dating service uh, was based out of Stanford, and that was 1965. And then another kind of pivotal moment happened uh, in the 1960s again by a Harvard student where they started using what was called Operation Match. And that connected like millions of daters in the U.S. in the 1960s. Uh, And so really there were dating machines that people were using and newspapers. Then after that, there was like video services where you would record yourself and then that would be uh, shared with other people. Um, and so there was video dating. Uh, that looked probably really different than we would think now because you had to go to the you know, studio, watch the videos, and then you, you picked out people from the videos to go on dates with. The first really modern dating website, now it wasn't an app yet, but the first really dating website was in 1994, and it was called Kiss.com. Um, and so most of us probably are not familiar with that. Uh, and that was followed by match.com in 1995, um, which I think most people are familiar with that because then of course that led to the development of, of their dating sites. Um, and then finally in 2000, San Francisco's Craigslist started offering, uh, personal ads, um, and so people were hooking up through Craigslist. And then in 2004, uh, years and years and years later, uh, the people at Harvard that did Operation Match actually launched OkCupid. Um, So there was a long history of people um, doing stuff in the dating world, like making dating apps and making dating uh, personal ads and so on and so forth, and then it eventually morphed into where it is now. And if you look at, like, uh, even the history of uh, the people who developed, like, you know, Operation Match, and then later that became OK Cupid. In 2005, the people who developed, like, PayPal, okay, three people who worked for PayPal actually started an online video dating service called TuneIn Hookup. Um, and they based it on Hot or Not, which was like a photo voting site in the 2000s, you know. Online dating stuff or dating services have led to huge leaps just in general technology itself. Um, another big one was like Grinder, which is was used for mainly gay men and gay couples. That launched in 2009. Um, what's interesting, even by 2009, over 60% of similar gender or same-sex couples, at least in the U.S., had found partners online. So one of the things that a lot of people don't realize is the LGBTQIA plus communities have been using like online dating longer than most people in straight communities. And so that's a big difference. Probably the biggest leap in more hetero based communities and partnerships for online dating really was the emergence of Tinder in 2012. I mean, Tinder has just dominated since then. Uh, and today, almost 50% of people in northern, uh, you know, tight North American, Western countries have known someone who uses these services or has met someone through the services. 
the modern conception of what a dating app is, for example, Tinder, if you were describing it to someone who doesn't know what an app is or doesn't know what, what's involved in it, could you describe that for us? Sure, yeah. So what a dating app is, is it's, it's you know, it's, it's on your phone. It uses uh, some GPS location capabilities. Uh, it's an application, much like other applications you might use on your phone, like Gmail or an Alexa app, or like, you know, many of us are ordering groceries online. It's probably more similar to ordering groceries in many ways. Um, you you open it up, and then there's images of people. Those are like profile pictures, like Facebook has, um, and. It'll use GPS location capability, meaning it can tell you how close or how far someone is from you um, based on their smartphone application and the GPS services. Um, And then it shows just a brief overview. The person writes up a little bit about who they are, and then it's got some images, usually somewhere between three to five images. And then you can swipe, and that literally just is when you take your finger and run it across. Uh, the the picture, and then if you swipe right, uh, lots of times that indicates, at least in some dating apps like Tinder, that indicates you have interest uh, in the person. You swipe right. If you swipe left, that means that you don't have interest. And then once you, if you make a connection, like the other person swiped on your picture, um, then it's a match. And then you can start communicating with each other in like a private messenger uh, service. Um, yeah, so that's basically what what a modern dating app is like. And uh, do we have any evidence of of what percentage of the people that match are actually meeting up and getting together and you know yeah, becoming a, an item? So we do. I mean, there are a lot of people historically. Um, that were connecting through dating apps and then at least meeting up, you know, one time to see how it goes. Um, During COVID, so for the last, like, you know, depending on the country you're in, the last eight months, (laughs) um, many people are still connecting through dating apps, uh, but, but they're not, the people meeting each other has decreased. So many people are connecting through dating apps right now, um, you know, because they're single um, or perhaps like, you know, they have some sort of agreement in a relationship where they can see more than one person. And so they're connecting and they're doing like Zoom dates. Many people are not um, meeting up right now, but for a while there. I mean, the trends were really amazing. About one in five, like, 18 to 24-year-olds, at least in, like, the North American area, were using dating applications, meeting, connecting. Uh, I mean, one in five is huge. And that was a huge jump back in the early 2000s, like the data from 2003 showed it was only 5%. In that population of 18 to 24-year-olds, that, that has been the biggest consumer um, regardless of other demographics, and they still are the biggest consumer. What kind of um, behaviours are being displayed uh, on these dating apps? For example, is there more sex happening? Uh, there's that kind of reputation, maybe that misconception that people are using it purely for hookups, like that Tinder is just for sex. Is is, is that accurate or is that completely, uh, you know, uh, inaccurate? a really great question. A lot of people ask this. I do think historically there there have been kind of, you know, uh, stereotypes or descriptions that seem to fit better with certain dating platforms than others. So, you know, Bumble, for example, is really woman controlled. Like a woman uh, can communicate with men and women and you know, pretty freely, and men can't easily communicate with women. Um, So the purpose there is so that it's a little bit more like women in control and women making choices about, you know, who they want to connect with versus Tinder, where it's definitely been like men lead the way in connecting. And the reputation of Tinder is that 
Um, it's used just to pretty much hook up, not for like serious dating or just friendship or marriage, which marriage would be something we associate more with like eHarmony or like Match.com. But yeah, there definitely can be perceived differences based on the platform. Like it's different to use OkCupid than it is to use Bumble. And if you get into things like um, FetLife, then you're going to the place where, I mean, that's still a dating app, but it's also for like kink BDSM. So it really depends on the platform, what the intentions can be, and then how people use it. Um, I think the younger generations, like millennials and Gen Zers, which I know in this pandemic, they kind of got renamed to Zoomer generation, but those generations, you know, they're actually hooking up less than previous generations which confuses people because there's this assumption, well, you're using all these dating apps, so aren't you hooking up more? But apparently that isn't really what the the data is showing, at least not in comparison to the good old days. Like I'm a, I'm a Gen Xer, and back in the day you just, you know, you went to a bar, you went and hung out at a party with friends, and that's how you met people to hook up with. And apparently the rates of hookup were actually higher in those generations before the dating apps, which I think really surprises people. I suppose that's a, a partly as a result of the intersection between, I suppose, relationships are mediated through uh, digital spaces now uh, as they they weren't before. And so that, that being able to verbally con- converse with the opposite sex or the same sex uh, at a party is not a skill that uh, younger people need at the moment. Uh, or the, yeah. I think that's totally true. And, you know, we'll see how how that changes or not. Um, but one of the things that's really different about online courtship versus like, you know, if you just meet people in person um, through friends, which is still the number one way that people date is through connections through friends. It's still more popular than even online dating. But one of the big differences in the courtship is the speed. And it's exactly what you just alluded to. Like people are talking with each other online and they usually use text-based communication. So either they'll go into a private chat or they'll text, you know, directly, or there'll be like some sort of messenger function. And actually that what we have found in research repeatedly now across relationships, whether it's like dating or friendship or colleagues, is the speed of intimacy and vulnerability is actually much more rapid in text-based communication than it is if if you go to a party and talk to someone in person or if you call them or if you video chat. It's actually faster um, to get close to people just through texting. Would you attribute that to, I suppose, the um, the awkwardness of, of actual conversation that you sometimes say something incorrectly or that, you know, it's more embarrassing to say, you know, uh, do, do you like this, do you like that uh, in person than it is, uh, you know, you can just write it down and it's gone, you know, and there's a little bit of, I suppose, anxiety associated with, you know, do you like me, question mark, but it's, it's you know, it's fleeting, whereas, you know, when you're in the moment and you have that interpersonal kind of, uh, I, I suppose, emotions running high, it's much more difficult to say the things that you mean. Yeah, I think that is absolutely astute. Yes, I think when we're actually, I think, first of all, lots of people, um, you know, I mean, charisma is hard, you know, for many people just having the charisma. And the other part of it is we're not really taught how to communicate with people in real time very well. And certainly the pandemic isn't helping us in that context either. And so there is definitely an awkwardness in just communicating in person um, or not in text-based ways that I think exists for lots of people. Um, And then what's, what's really interesting too about that is the fear of rejection in person, right? Or over the phone um, or in a video. I mean, you can see the person's reaction you know, if you say, hey, I like you, do you like me too? Like that fear of rejection in, in immediate time in a real sense is just painful for people versus if I, you know, send that in a text and I say, hey, I like you, I, I'm interested in you, let's meet up. 
the sense of rejection isn't isn't necessarily felt the same way or experienced in the same intensity or immediacy in in an in a text based communication. So I think I think what you're implying is is that it's less threatening, and I think that's totally accurate. And um, just just on those kind of, on dating apps like Tinder and on Bumble, what's being signaled like you know from my personal experiences uh, using them that women tend to uh, show that they're having a good laugh, but not you know that they're not they're not drunk and rolling around the place like some of the lads' photos would be. You know, lads <laughs> want to show you know wealth in their photos. You know you know, these kind of things like, well, you know, I'm doing well in life, you know, I'm physically healthy, you know, you know, the bikini uh, pic or the, the pic on the beach in the shorts. This, uh, these are types of things that I see cropping up all the time. W- what have you noticed or observed? Yes, absolutely. People are really thoughtful or not about the kind of photos and information they share on dating apps. I think the biggest thing that I see is dogs. Um, <sighs> I think there's this huge idea, and and I think it's probably based in research. People like dogs. People like people who like dogs. Uh, Women like men who have dogs and like dogs. So a lot of the images that I see of men in dating profiles is there's at least one picture of them with a dog. Um, Because I think it's, it's been, you know, shared widely that, that women like dogs and that's important. So get, you know, get a dog or get a picture with a dog. Um, and I, and I think that does, you know, that does communicate something. Um, I think the issue comes in if, if that's not your dog <laughs> and you've kind of said it is, how are you, how are you going to go forward with this, you know, moving forward? Um, the other thing I see really commonly, like you said, is physical things, people doing physical things, you know, people playing soccer or going rock climbing or doing a hike or, you know, going on a boat or fishing, um, you know, saying things like you're active. Um, back in the day when we could travel, um, you know, different pictures of different places showing that you have like an active lifestyle, which also denotes like that you must have some income. Mm. Otherwise, you probably can't travel. Um, when I... When I see people who post pictures like with kids, that that always kind of confuses me. On the one hand, I think it's you know it's smart to be transparent if you um, are serious about connecting with people. It's good to let them know that you know there's kids in your life, whether you're like an aunt or an uncle, or you know you just you're a parent or whatever the case may be. So I get wanting those pictures. My big issue is what is that communicating and you know, did the kid consent to be in the picture and how would how would it feel? You know, I mean, it's almost like bringing your kid on a date to put, put the kid's picture on a profile picture. So that's, I think, a little bit problematic. The other thing to think about is, you know, in the current time, do you want to have pictures of, like, you wearing a mask or not? Maybe have, like, one so people know you're thoughtful and you're conscientious, but maybe don't have that be, like, every mask. I mean, every picture is, is you know, you in a mask. We, we do want to see, you know, your face in general, like classic headshots where, you know, you're not wearing a hat or sunglasses and you're actually smiling. Like you mentioned, a lot of women kind of look like they're laughing. Those are all good things in a, in a, in a classic kind of headshot because you want to you wanna read approachable and friendly and if you're wearing like a hat or sunglasses or looking cold, like usually that actually you think it's mysterious maybe, but it actually reads as unapproachable online and people get a little nervous about that. Um, like you want a full body pick, a lifestyle pick, which is the one where it shows like that you're doing something. And then like a, a, a bonus picture, which I'm telling you is almost always dogs. That's right. <laughs> dogs. And in terms of, like, the actual data, when you kind of look at the behavior of pictures and men and women, you know, men tend to view more profiles than women do. Uh, Men view three times more profiles than women on average. And men are also 40% more likely to initiate contact than women. So, you know, as a woman, when I've been on platforms, um, 
I get inundated and that's not because I'm some sort of like wild eyed catch, right? It's not like, oh, Marky's amazing. I mean, maybe it is. I don't know. But just more men are on it and looking at woman profiles and message more women. It makes it really hard as a man who's interested in women to actually like get attention or stand out in good ways in online dating platforms because you kind of blend in. And so, well, it might seem like a good idea to just say hi in your message. You know, the first time you reach out to a woman, remember, she probably has gotten like 15 to 20 messages already in the last day or two. And so just saying hi, you need to stand out in a different way. When my current partner of the last like five years, we met online. Um, when he reached out to me, instead of saying hi, he just said, hey, you know, um, I don't mean to intrude, but I think we work together, and I just wanted to let you know that I saw your profile. <laughs> and I was like, oh, my God, we work together. What does that mean? So it got my attention, right? It's good to have a way to connect with people that gets attention, and you don't just blend in to sort of the background that comes with online dating. Right, that it should, it should be sort of re- remarkable in some way, you know, uh, I suppose the the barrier there is that uh, there's a lot of guys out there that are a wee bit nervous and that would be like, hey, that would be a big jump for them. But then, you know, if you, you know, if you build up a, you know, a skill or a verbal fluency on these dating apps, then you might go for something a bit more, you know, closer to your personality. Just as a, as a side note there, uh, when I had a exactly. dating app, yeah, when, when I had da- a dating app uh, profile, I had a dog in the, in the photo and it wasn't mine. So uh, <laughs> just a little... Uh, uh, ad- you. addition. I you. It's all about the dogs. All yeah, about very, the dogs. very accurate. Um, and just, just following on from that, why do you think it is that men solicit more, look through more women's profiles than, than women look through men's? What, what do you think the cause of that is? Is there a biological kind of origin there? I, you know, that's a great question. I'm, I'm not sure why. I mean, I think some of it might just be. I think men have been socially sort of like conditioned in many Western cultures to, you know, look at women, look at women online, look at women in magazines. I think that's been something that's really acceptable um, for a long time. And so I think there's maybe greater comfort for men in just, you know, being like, oh, that person looks interesting. That person doesn't, you know, I'm going to swipe I know some men use the tactic of just swiping right on everybody um, because you you just don't know. I mean, the odds of someone responding are pretty low, and so it's better to just blanket approach <laughs> than to be more selective. Um, I don't know. I think maybe it's socialization. There could be just some biological drive too, though, right? Like, because... You know, if you take it, anytime I'm thinking about online stuff, I like to try to think of the offline equivalent. Okay. So, like, I think historically men have, you know, been better, you know, they've been expected to, I don't know if it's better, but they've been expected to be the ones that initiate courtship, that initiate going up and talking, and especially in, like, cisgender heterosexual relationships, like, they're the ones that go up and talk to the women, they're the ones that get the number, you know, And so I think a lot of that has transferred into that norm has transferred into the world of online dating. And uh, just just there with, um, I suppose we've talked about the kind of aesthetics of the dating app, but the actual behaviours and the terminology that's kind of wrapped up in there, you know, like ghosting, you know, like super liking, um, you know, these terms, uh, like what are the sort of behaviours, like you you said it's, it's, it's more rapid, uh, as you know a courtship but what what are some of the behaviors you know sending pictures of oneself what, what are some other you know observable uh, observable phenomenon that you could speak of yeah absolutely um well you mentioned ghosting and i think that definitely happens in online dating that's where you'll be communicating with someone maybe you've uh already met once or hooked up once or just on a video date, or maybe you're just still in the text-based communication part, but things are going well. And then without any explanation, the person just stops talking to you. 
Uh, they stop messaging you back. They stop sending you pictures. And, and that's what people have called ghosting. That has been going on long before online dating. That would happen in regular text-based communication and in emails. And a lot of times it's because we don't hold ourselves as accountable um, in in technology-based communications in part because we're like, oh, well, I mean, I don't, I don't really have to connect with this person because they're not really right in front of me and I don't have to see the actual, you know, consequences of my, what I would consider to be rude behavior, right? I mean, can you imagine if you and I were talking in person, JJ, and I just mid-conversation, I don't answer you and I turn around and walk away? <laughs> that's, that's insane, right. right? It's rude. It's it's weird. That's the same thing. It's just happening in a in a text based way. The other thing that's happening in relation to ghosting, and this is new, is called submarining. Have you heard of this? No, I have not. Go go ahead. Okay, so submarining is where someone has ghosted you, but then they resurface later with no acknowledgement to the fact that they just ghosted <laughs> you for like two weeks, right? They just act like everything's fine. So it's like submarining. They come up for air and then they go back under. So (sighs) these behaviors are very frustrating for people. Um, And, you know, the thing of it is, is it's okay if you don't want to communicate with someone anymore. It's good if you at least let them know that. Like, you know, hey, I've really appreciated our conversation, but... I'm going to go ahead and move on. Like, I hope things go well. I just don't think it's going to work out. That's a lot nicer than just leaving people, you know, never talking to them again because it seems easy or it seems like it's not real connection. But that's really unfair. And we wouldn't do that to people in real life. Um, Catfishing is where, and this is really common. So if you've had experience online dating, I don't know if you've experienced it, but I have. Um, I would say this goes with the idea of anonymity. So one of the things about technology in general is you can be anonymous, right? Um, On the other hand, sometimes it's difficult to be anonymous because our society has made it so easy to find us uh, online. But one of the things about it is you have to figure out how you're going to manage your own anonymity online and other people's. Because what will happen is people will put together a profile that is false. It's a false representation of themselves. Um, and that's, you know, and then they proceed to connect with you in a dating context or otherwise. And then um, generally they just communicate with you online and don't meet in person. But sometimes, you know, you do meet in, in person. And the goal here is to maintain this facade. So it's to con you into believing this person is a different person than who they are or that parts of them are different. So in my own personal experience, this has happened to clients I work with. It's really disturbing. My one experience, so for my my own part, about four or five years ago, I decided to do like my own online dating self-study. So I was completely transparent. I said, I'm doing this for, you know, personal research. Um, I went on three different platforms like OkCupid, Bumble, I think Tinder, and I just almost said yes to everybody, JJ, like men, women, you know, gender queer people, just went out with everybody um, because I was literally doing research and I was super curious. Um, and this one guy um, that I'd been talking with um, on Bumble for probably about three weeks, he was great, super fun to talk to. Um, we'd exchanged some pictures. I was very excited to meet him. And when I met him, he just appeared, and this is really true, like lots of people lie about their bodies and the way they look online. Right. Um, and he, the images he shared with me were clearly like years earlier. The thing of it was is I actually wasn't upset by that because, remember, my intentions and my motivations were not to like find an actual partner. It was just to explore what it's like to online date. And I really actually felt that this was a good person. I think that's not true catfishing. He wasn't pretending to be a totally different person with a different identity. But, you know, he wasn't transparent about how he looked currently. 
I didn't really care because I, I understood that. And I just think he was so happy to be going out with someone like almost all the men I went out with just for coffee and to like interview them. They were just so happy someone had said yes. Like, you know, and, and at the end of the day, maybe that's, maybe that's kindness. Um, but true catfishing, I think, is pretty, like, uncomfortable for people. The other term that's really emergent is this whole super-like term, right. and that's a Tinder term. That's where a person gets told that you like them, so normally when you swipe, the person doesn't get notified unless it's a match, unless they like you too. But what you can do is you can you can engage in this practice of super-like where you actually let them know that you like them without them having to match with you too. But that doesn't mean anything because that person might not like you back. So so then it might feel kind of doubly bad, right? Because you risked letting them know you like them and then they ignore you. <laughs> so right. yeah, those are just some kind of common behaviors and terms. And, and just, just on your research, uh, was it difficult for you to maintain objectivity since that you were doing the research, but you were also... Presumably, you were attracted to the the people that you swiped right on, or who who you matched with, and w- was that tricky? It really was, yeah. I mean, because there was definitely like, I mean, so in the course of I did this uh, probably for about three weeks to a month, I would say a month, and I have full journals of it. I just haven't published it. Um. And for that whole month, I basically, if I matched with someone, I just, I just went out with them. Like, I'd be like, hey, let's, let's go have coffee. I'm doing this research. I'm curious. It was challenging. There were definitely people that were interesting. And, and I mean that in a really kind way where, where I live half of my life in the Midwest, the word interesting actually is, is kind of a, a bad word, oddly enough. But they were definitely interesting and and um, attractive, uh, and yeah, I mean there was a lot of, of curiosity about people. But I maintained distance. Um, I threw out like if anybody contacted me that I knew in a different context, right? Like I threw their data out, so I didn't, you know, if like a friend reached out to me on there. I wasn't going to, you know, go out with them on a date and I wasn't going to include that. So there were some exceptions, but honestly, if you, if you just make the choice to go out with, you know, kind of everybody, um, it really changes how you feel about online dating and it really opens your world up. And there would have been a, there would have been out of those people, I probably went out with 50 people. Wow. There was probably three or four people that would have been interesting to me in a personal way. Yeah. And and then uh, just just following on from that, uh, in terms of if we're if we look at the uh, zoomers as you call them, I, I hadn't heard that term, um, but the zoomer generation um, and the generation that were born with phones in their hands, um, do you think that this will be the main jump off point uh, that that it's leading towards the courtship? but that it will be the first step won't be the nightclub or the pub or the bar or the dance. It will be the online dating and then meet up in person. I think that is a great question. I think that question would have been harder to answer before the pandemic because before the pandemic, I think, you know, young people, I, I have a 13-year-old. That 13-year-old would have, you know, junior high or middle school dances happening. That isn't happening. <laughs> so there is no option. I think for, for like, in-person meetup for young people, whether it's, you know, junior high, high school, even colleges and universities are pretty, like, restrictive in terms of in-person in- in- engagement. So I think... That has changed at least the way people are are meeting, the youth are meeting, connecting, and dating right now. But I think we were already headed in that direction. I mean, this has now become the norm for many people in terms of dating. The way you date is you do do it online, and that is how you date. And, you know, then you meet people in person and, and start to get to know them. I'm I'm not sure, to be totally honest with you, JJ, 
I actually think those Gen Zers or those Zoomers, as they age, now many of them are in college right now, the traditional age folks, and, and I think they're using, well, I know they're using dating apps. Um, what we've seen with COVID is that young people and people across the age spectrum are using dating apps primarily as ways to connect with people, especially single people, because they're isolated. Um, so even though they're not using them to hook up, they're using them for connection. But I do think it'll almost be passe for, like, the younger Gen Zers and Zoomers and the kids that are coming up. I think they'll be like dating apps. Why bother? Because I think they're already so connected to each other that I I don't think that'll be step one. So for you know, for example, like my kid and a lot of their friends all play like Fortnite and other online games. Um, they might use you know social media platforms, but they're not using like TikTok or Facebook. They're using like I don't know, some obscure one, right, that only them and their friends know about. My kid was like, the person I like, like, sent me a friend request on this social media app, which means they might like me. The bar for, like, how you date and dating apps will actually shift, and it'll just be like, well, the way that we met is we were playing, like, you know, uh, Fortnite, and then we started hanging out in Fortnite, and then eventually we hung out in person. So I think for younger people, they're so immersed in online reality with each other that I, I think almost dating apps will become passe. That's, that's sort of my guess, oddly enough. I, I, I suppose that, that nature always finds a way and that, uh, you know, even in, in a world where, you know, you, you can't go out and meet people like there's actual physical restrictions in place and then I suppose the generation of, of people who are prone to technology and then on then you know even still they find ways to meet up and you know through Fortnite right. you know which is which is so interesting and I, I just I'm kind of interested to get your take on the law like the law of un- unintended consequences like you talked at the top of the show about I suppose the uh these zoomers are having less sex than you know they're the the baby boomers of the 1950s and 60s yep i think you are totally spot on that is a great uh moderating and mediating effect that you're noticing so one of the things that we're seeing is because of i think because of the millennial and especially the zoomers you know immersive lives with their technology, there just really isn't the same distinction between technology and uh, offline self, you know, technology-based self and and world and offline real life world. There does seem to be, um, you know, greater overlap in those experiences for young people. And one of the things we're seeing is there's, like I said, a delay in sexual contact with other people. Uh, they're, so they're having sex, whatever that means, traditional sex, where they actually see another person in person and have actual contact physically. That, there's a delay in that for the young people, and there's also less partners. Um, so one hypothesis is, you know, well, maybe some people are just, you know, their preferred way of being sexual or relating is through technology. Um, And my colleague, Dr. Neil MacArthur and I, who's at a university in Manitoba, um, and he's a sexual ethicist, like I thought I had a good job, but holy cow, sexual ethicist just sounds cool. Um, But we came up with the term digisexual a couple years ago, 2017, which is just this idea that technology mediates um, our sexual interactions. And I think for that younger generation, the Zoomers, I think that first wave digisexuality, like using dating apps or using pornography or using like sex toys, I think all of that, you know, they're doing this more and and it's more normative for them because of their just immersive relationships with technology. And it's meaning that they're not 
um, engaging with each other um, physically as much. The other group of folks, and I don't think this is widely happening yet because it, it's cost prohibited. The other group of folks are the people who are going to, it's second wave digisexuality where it's like the virtual reality sex, the sex robots, um, you know, the artificial um, implanting of robotic devices onto bodies and so on and so forth. That kind of wave of sex tech, I think young people do have interest in, but no one can afford it. And that's when you get into the people who really, they're like, nope, I don't have interest in humans and sex. I'm only interested in technology and sex. So those would be people who I think emerging will literally just call themselves digisexual. Like, and I do think the younger generation, we're going to have a lot more of those folks. Fascinating. So, and hey, they can't get anybody pregnant. They can't get pregnant. And you really can't, you know, share STIs or COVID if, if all you're doing is having sex through a computer or with a robot. So there are some advantages. So. Right, right. Yeah. And um, maybe the downsides be, uh, you know, I suppose a downsizing of population, but maybe that's not a bad thing either. Um, exactly. We have we have almost 8 billion people now. Yeah, so. overpopulation is a thing. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. And, and it, I totally see that. And just, in, Marky, in terms of uh, your sex research, and I'm just, this is a little bit off topic, but it's uh, in terms of the pandemic, you know, I, I heard from... Um, a, a researcher uh, this is, uh, three or four years ago that people tend to have sex uh, more in the winter than they do in the summer and is this the same for the pandemic that uh, people are having more sex that there's a baby boom expected particularly in twenty the summer of 2021 uh, because of the you know the lockdown restrictions um, do you have any sort of uh, research or, or have uh, observed any of of this, you know, um, I suppose, information on this? Yeah, this is a great question. And there are definitely, I have some scholars, some scholarly friends who've been doing research on this specifically, um, mainly based out of the Kinsey Institute, which is out of Indiana. Um, so I have some colleagues that have been looking at trends around, like, frequency of sex uh, and the pandemic, because kind of early on, I think you're right. I think people thought, oh, we're going to have so many babies when, you know, lockdown lifts because um, people have more sex in winters because, you know, it's cold, it's dark, you're trapped in the house with someone. And so, you know, you have more sex and, and you have babies that come out in spring. And, and that does happen in some cold places. I'm originally from Alaska. Um, yep, that is definitely kind of a whether it's true or just an everyday sort of urban legend or a cultural myth, it seems to be true. So people kind of thought the same thing about the pandemic. What we're actually seeing is there's, on average, there's less sex happening. So in people that are already couples, uh, there's less sex happening. And in single people, there seems to be less partnered sex happening. What has increased is people's practicing of novelty, so, like, couples and singles have been having new and different kinds of sexual activity because of an adjustment to the lockdown or just out of boredom or out of curiosity or opportunity. And so, for example, more couples and more single people are engaging in, like, first-wave digisexuality, like they're watching porn together, you know, they're buying different kind of sex toys, they're... They're doing these sorts of technology-based novelty things. They're doing other novelty things, too, like trying new positions, you know, having sex in different places, so on and so forth. So all kind of novelty acts are up for individuals and for relationships, people in relationships. However, satisfaction is down. So even though people are trying... Um, these novel things and they're having less sex, but they're kind of making the set sex more important or more significant or more meaningful. It actually seems that people are reporting that sex is uh, less satisfying. Even when it's newer forms of sex, they're just less satisfied in their sexual activity during this pandemic than they were, you know, before it. 
the, the group that's being especially hit hard, and I don't think this will shock anybody, um, but the group that's having the hardest time even having sex, let alone enjoying the sex, are people with school-age children. So people who have kids that are in school, that of course now those schools, a lot of them are, are at home or, you know, it's a hybrid or they'll be at school for five days and then have to come home for a week or two weeks because of quarantine, right? The people with school-age kids, like couples with school-age kids, are barely having any sex and just they're not prioritizing it at all. They're just like, I, I can barely work and make sure my kids are like doing their schoolwork and eating you know the last thing i'm worried about is sex and that's what that's what a lot of the data is showing so and i don't know how it'll change afterwards jj it was funny i asked i teach a large human sexuality class at the university of wisconsin stout for undergrad students so like 18 to 24 year old people and it was all online this semester and i asked them what they thought would happen like do you think people will have more sex after this do you think more people will hook up you know so this is informal but my students were like i think it'll be the same amount of sex or more after the pandemic so either people will have the same amount of sex they had you know new partners and such before the pandemic or it'll go up so none of my young folks in my class thought that the trend of sex decreasing and being less satisfying would continue after the pandemic. And I hope they're right. I mean, I, I want to believe that this group of 18 to 24 year olds is right. <laughs> That's what I hope. Yeah, I, I, I hope so, too. I think the um, the sort of uh, prophecies of, of a, a repeat of uh, a century ago with the roaring 20s, uh, it's just something nice to look forward to, you know, just even if it was if even, even if it wasn't even uh, in a sense, you know, with sex, but just in spending and just being f- like free and out and, and, you know, being able to, you know, go out in public and you know, socialize, that would be wonderful. Um, I, I suppose. I know, I agree. I miss it so much. So I, I really hope the 1920s in that sense are repeated. So, and that the college students are right. <laughs> uh, on that note, uh, we'll finish up. Uh, thank you very much for joining me. That is Dr. Marky Twist. Thank you so much, JJ. I appreciate it.